getting out the tank. Wait, wait. Hello, pal. Okay, start moving forward. We were in the backyard, and that, yeah. there will probably never be a time in history oh, when no. we will have this kind of an opportunity again. Yeah. We were spying, you know, and um, they knew it, and we knew they knew it. 729. 737. He uh, sort of ignored the warning, and he was shot. They had to cover up the, the chief of staff. A lot of people were rammed, they were pushed off the road, they were shot at. It was clearly dangerous. This is actual footage filmed by British Cold War spies. At the height of the Cold War, a small group of British, American and French troops spent their days driving into enemy territory and spying on Soviet forces. And from there, that's where we hope to see the next series of kit trains. They were the only Western forces to regularly get up close and personal with the enemy. This is the story of Bricksmiths. A tale of espionage, capture behind enemy lines, and death in foreign territory. They've stopped, they have seen us. Get ready to go, Al. Modern day Berlin, the height of sophistication and liberal German democracy. Checkpoint Charlie, once the official border between East and West. Now a tourist attraction with people dressed in period costume posing for photos. Parts of the Berlin Wall itself remain standing, a colorful reminder of darker times. But at the height of the Cold War, the divided city was a fearful place. When you were being chased, when you got caught, uh, particularly if you're on a training area, a lot of the Soviet troops had live ammunition and so therefore the first thing they would do is surround the vehicle and if they had weapons they would all point them at the vehicle. You don't go to someone else's country, drive around not following their regulations and, not, and expect it to be not dangerous. The cooperation that had seen the Allies defeat Nazi Germany in the Second World War ended very soon after it. But amid the destruction and devastation, the Allies took drastic action, carving up Germany into four different occupation zones. In the east, roughly a third of the country would now be controlled by Russia, and the remaining two-thirds in the west would come under American, British and French control. The German capital, Berlin, was also split into east and west a border which became literally set in stone in 1961 when the communist-controlled East erected the Berlin Wall. Mutual distrust and the constant fear of nuclear war led to the paranoia and suspicion of the Cold War years. But part of the deal that had divided Germany led to the creation of military missions. These were meant to liaise with the other wartime allies but in reality, the men of Bricksmus, the British Commander-in-Chief's mission to the Soviet forces, were in a perfect position to spy on their former ally. Under liaison rules, 31 men in the unit had permission to travel into what was now enemy territory. Nothing in the window. Seen enough black tabs. Scud again, black tabs. No other monitors. And even though they had to wear uniform and drive marked cars, they were able to bend the rules beyond breaking point to gather vital intelligence on exactly what the Soviets were up to. We didn't ever have any confidential talks inside the house. We always went into the garden, and then we subsequently found out after reunification that the Stasi had a long-range microphone across the lake. It would be nice to have gone and, and reflected on that. You know, People who used to spy for a living, like Dave Butler, get don't get less curious. There's a car in the drive. And, uh, they do get a little more careful. 
years gone by, I would have jumped over the fence. <laughs> in the late 80s, Dave Butler served in Bricksmiths. He was a tour NCO, working with a tour officer and a driver as part of a close-knit three-man team. Thirty years after the wall came down, Dave is back in the former East Germany. He's looking for the man who sheltered him behind the lines and a former Soviet adversary, now willing to go on the record about the deaths and cover-ups that were once state secrets. The former Soviet Liberosa tank range is where Dave made one of his most important finds. We very much are where the T-80s used to run down here, firing on the move. This is actual footage shot by Bricksmiths in the 1980s when they were a covert intelligence unit. For British troops at this time, Cold War Germany was a dangerous place to be, and this kind of access to the East was almost unheard of for Western forces. Oh, that looks like it goes. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is where this is where the tank would have driven into. Bear in mind, what you have to remember here is that none of these trees were here. 33 years ago, this was a tank range. So there was nothing here between here and the four kilometres. I can zoom in on. Can you get the numbers? Seven two nine. Seven three seven. Bricksmiths tour officers and NCOs would use discarded ammunition and kit they found here to extrapolate key information about the thousands of Soviet troops who were garrisoned in East Germany. As soon as the tanks had left, we would drive onto the range and we would start to scavenge and, um, and try to pick up anything we could. The, the Soviets were very poor in their, in their discipline in that if a, if a tank round or something like that didn't work, they would uh, just throw it over the top. This is where we got hold of their fin stabilised, um, discarding sabo round, uh, complete ones that, you know, just because it, it didn't quite go in the breach, it was a little bent, they threw it over the side. And, and, I'm, and I'm sure that our, uh, our intelligence agencies made a lot of intelligence out of that. So this looks like a piece of uh, Russian discarded munition. Uh, I'm just trying to see, I think that's a Russian, well, I would call a, a P, but we were a Russian R, and then there's a hyphen, three dashes, followed by, I guess that's a three. Okay, so I think, I think this is RPG. Can you get over and turn around? Yeah. In the 1980s, the T-80 tank was at the heart of the Soviet war machine. And top of NATO's target acquisition list was something called an explosive reactive armour box, or ERA box, a clever piece of armour that tripled the resistance of the brand new T-80. Finding an ERA box was so important in intelligence terms, the Bricksmiths team hatched a daring and dangerous plan to get hold of one. And the idea was that the tanks would load on a ramp very similar to the one behind us here uh, onto the railway flats and we would uh, board the train as it pulled out, get onto it, find a tank and, and take the box off. The challenge that we had of course was the boxes were all well held on by nuts and we didn't know what size nut it actually was. We took some close-up photography of it and then did some like, telemetry on it, uh, but we still couldn't be sure. So we found uh, a spanner, this spanner actually, which, which has got four different sizes on. So we figured that, that one of these would fit. That was the plan. But in fact, on a routine range scavenge, Dave struck lucky. And I was just walking into a revetment uh, similar to this one, and, and what caught my eye was just a little bit of green sticking out of the, out of the uh, sand like this. And, uh, and so I thought, oh, that looks odd. And all I did was I bent down like this, reached in, picked it up, and, uh, and pulled out 
pulled out and what I knew instantly was an ERA box and uh, and and suddenly around me was all this music and stuff like that a bit like you know if you'd won the lottery you know it's that one of those moments in time when you just know you've got something here they come <laughs> Analysis of the ERA box revealed NATO anti-tank weaponry was not strong enough to penetrate Soviet armour, sending weapons designers back to the drawing board. All such discoveries were made as part of a three-man team. Dave often worked with retired Major General Peter Williams. There we go. There we go with both men spending many days at a time out hunting for intelligence. Because this Hotel Mercure here was the Inter-Hotel, wasn't it? It was the yes. big, the big um, yeah. Yeah. prestige communist hotel. Yeah, we always used to say in, in Dresden, the Hotel Neva. Yeah. And interesting enough, um, we were always put on the 13th floor and we always seemed to get the same rooms. So we just concluded that, yeah. that the Stasi were well, we had them all wired and that. You we know. went on a, a town tour once in Wittenberg and it was the weekend of the East German guard dog training championship <laughs> or something. And it turned out that um, nobody had warned the Stasi that we were coming and there were no other rooms available and several lots of people were turfed out of their rooms so that the Stasi <laughs> could have the rooms on either side yeah. of ours. Yeah. And uh, it was all rather unsubtle. And when we used to go on the cultural tours, of course, I always used to make sure I put the kids where the narcs were and then take their picture and you can always tell the yeah. narcs because in the background they were the ones looking in their newspapers and they or got, yeah. appearing not to and they didn't want their photograph taken because eventually the photograph would make it to the bnd Correct. to the yeah. to the german yeah. security services and then they could never be deployed in the west as Precisely, a yeah. sleeper agent or whatever. yeah yeah i've got a whole series of photographs that were sent to me by um, chap who wrote a book about the mission here, Mark Prufer, and he met a mysterious Herr Bloom. And Herr Bloom, when he said, um, uh, you know, I was helped by Peter Williams to write this book, gave me lots of pictures and things, he said, ah, Captain Williams. And he went next door in his flat and came back with a, um, a Stasi photographic surveillance file <laughs> of um, us in an Opal senator at Barleben. So there's Jeff Fairburn and wow. me and um, Phil Claridge and we arrived and it's got a whole sort of uh, thing if you wanted to be immortalized as very <laughs> professional this is not the this is not the series of photographs because yeah, we yeah. got very bored it was a very hot day and at one stage i sat on the roof of the car with a beanie hat on reading a book and <laughs> jeff fairburn took his shirt off to get a suntan yeah and then a train came along and the, the stasi file even has the train which was full of uh, east german artillery and things like this but we were unaware that they were watching us while we were watching <laughs> watching them as yeah. it were. Um, and like they, that spy versus spy isn't yeah, it you know so. but in those encounters it wasn't always the west who came out on top there we go it's a four ship coming round again if the men on the ground overstepped the mark consequences could be severe After 700 meters, go straight on. Yard. Every word. <laughs> Just two blokes sharing a joke in the car. So here I am with a man from the Soviet External Relations <laughs> Branch and a man from Bricksmiths <laughs> in the same vehicle together going around Potsdam. But from 1985 until 1989, Dave Butler and Sergei Savchenko were on opposite sides of the Iron Curtain. Dave ran missions into communist East Germany to spy on Soviet forces stationed there. And Sergei worked for Serb, the Soviet agency responsible for keeping tabs on Brixmas. This particular gate, it used to be electrical. <laughs> yeah, let, let me show you. Today, the old enemies are revisiting old haunts. Because these are all Oh, I see. Uh, these yeah, are all so so Soviet constructions, I'm telling yeah. you. We build them. Normally, the uh, visitors to us, chiefs of the missions, they came and they entered through the front door yeah. and they went to the second floor. Mm -hmm. On the second floor, we had a big table yeah. and we had only two windows. These two windows that you can see, actually. Uh -huh. And uh, normally, we were sitting, or they were seated, uh, 
against the window so that the light from the windows would be coming on them and we're sitting with our backs to the window. It, it uh, sort of, our faces were not really as, um, what do you call it, as expressive as theirs, yeah. but you could see every little movement so of, was, of any muscle un, of the face of so the... So it was unintentionally, so you it, could it read was, the body language. Unintentionally, yes. This is the final step before entering the DDR, the Glienicke Bridge. A Brixmas film training video introducing the famous Glienicke Bridge, the original bridge of spies where Cold War prisoners were once exchanged. This small steel structure links Berlin with Potsdam and spanned the front line of the Cold War for four decades. In those dark times, East and West Germany were entirely separate entities. 140 people were killed or committed suicide trying to escape the communist East. Today, these two retired spies are here for a conversation which would have been impossible 30 years ago. Did Bricksmiths really give you a major headache when we oh, were operating? Sense. Well, I would say, I would only say that the least, the least uh, problems that they had were from the French. The le <laughs> right, OK. They, they were the quietest. Oh, really? You know, I, I brought out the explosive reactive armour block box that, mm -hmm. that we recovered from a T-80. Um, I mean, it, was that, I don't know if that's a surprise now, but I mean, at the time, did you get any intelligence to suggest that that had actually happened? Did you know, and did you know, how important it was to the West at that time. Well, of course I could understand how important it was to the West, but the thing is that they did not always report to us such incidents. Right. It only when you got, when they got your fingers in the tail, in this case, yes. Yeah. yeah. But otherwise, it didn't work this way. Oh, OK. I mean, that's, that's really interesting, because, you know, we always like to think that, that we were able to to, to remove things without... I tell you more, when you removed it from the tank, uh, it is not a fact that they reported it. And, and is that just because, because that's the punishment, the Soviet the punishment for losing that would be very strict on them too, so they probably pretended that it never disappeared. There was no incentive, yeah. in, because the punishment really could be quite harsh. Yes, quite. And they didn't want to take it. Yeah. Um, I mean, was there anything else that you were aware of that, that we were well, doing? Well, some of the, I uh, have uh, hundreds of episodes. Yeah. Some of them are absolutely anecdotal. Yeah. Like, uh, there was an American vehicle that stopped for a while. The doors were open, and the soldiers could see that the American vehicle was about 200 meters from them. Actually, one of the soldiers said, Comrade Lieutenant, why don't you fire at these guys? He says, I don't have any ammo. He says, well, I have some. I have some. And he gave him a handful of cartridges. He loaded his gun, and he had to shoot. And he did shoot at a distance of 200 meters, and he hit it five times. The he, American vehicle? Yes, he, he hit the vehicle five times. Wow. When I was investigating that, you know what he said to me? Yes, there was a vehicle, and I fired several times in the direction of that vehicle without taking aim. <laughs> and which, which version of the story did you believe? Well, I believe that five bullets were landed in the, in the, in vehicle. the vehicle, and at 200 meters, <laughs> shooting in the direction of that <laughs> Vehicle hit and what did the what did the American general? Uh, there was a protest. I bet yeah, there was a protest, yeah. of course. Yeah, and we had to actually acknowledge that it was uh, unlawful. Yeah, and uh, we pledged to take measures that it should never happen again. Yeah, that's what we did. Right. Getting out the tank. Wait, wait. But there were times when the Soviets and the East German police crossed the line. Two men were killed working for the foreign missions. French officer Philippe Mariotti was rammed off the road by a Stasi vehicle in the city of Halle. And a year later, in 1985, 
US Major Arthur Nick Nicholson was shot dead by a Soviet sentry. Essentially, Nick went to you know a place that was a routine place to go, and he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He um, you know went to um, a, a training area that was pretty routine. I mean, it was something that people did every single day, as the Russians did the same Soviets. Um, and the guard was nervous, a kid, and you know didn't know what the heck he was doing, and that's the result. Stephen Hoyt worked closely with Major Nicholson in the U.S. mission before he was killed. It's even worse when you know the person personally, know their family, know their daughter, you know their dog, you know the whole bit. It's like when Nicholson was killed in March 1985, it was much too serious an incident to be brushed under the carpet. And in fact, it was the first crisis that Mr. Gorbachev had to face. He'd become the head of the Soviet Union only a week or so before, and suddenly on his plate was uh, a Soviet soldier having killed an American officer. At the time, the Soviet Union denounced Major Nicholson for trespassing and ignoring warnings. But today, Sergei Savchenko says that wasn't true. The soldier himself was not adequately or duly instructed as to how to behave in that situation. And he was kind of trigger happy on the one hand, and he he actually didn't know what to do. He was uh, excited, he was frightened, and uh, I don't know, he acted out of whatever what. Because responsibility for guarding military assets went directly to the top, there was also an incentive for the Soviet Union to make it look like Major Nicholson had been at fault. This created the, uh, the, the other attitude as to there was an actual transgressor who ignored all the signs, he ignored the barbed wire, who I don't know, penetrated, acted aggressively, and he was, he was warned, but he uh, sort of ignored the warning, and he was shot, and, and all this kind of stuff, you know, which was certainly not true. So a bit of a cover-up. It was kind of yeah, because they 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 wanted to they had to cover up the 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 chief of staff. East Germany in the 1980s. Cold War relations are at a new low. It's a dangerous place to operate for the foreign missions. In 1984, French soldier Philippe Mariotti is killed when his vehicle is driven off the road by the Stasi. In 1985, American Major Nick Nicholson is shot dead by a Soviet sentry. But despite the dangers, none of the mission members were armed. No Bricksmiths operatives carried weapons when they went out on tour. A couple of absolute no-nos were, we never took out anything written down about the targets that we had to get, because we were always very conscious that at any moment the vehicle might be rammed, we might be broken into, and so everything in the vehicle would be turned out by the Soviets, and, and every bit of evidence that they could find to incriminate us you know, uh, would be useful. So we never took anything out about the targets. The only things we marked on our maps, uh, our map is, was, was a little Z, which was a Z platz where we used to sleep at night. And the other one was a little ice cream cone um, that we put over the map, which was where the, the ice cream parlors were. Because again, you know, it's hot out, out on tour and, and we often used to like to stop for an ice cream. We only found out when a vehicle got turned over and the, Russia, uh, and the Soviets took, took the maps out and, and they accused us uh, of either plotting nuclear detonations of ours on them or where we thought their nuclear storage sites were. Because of the little conical shape of a cone and a little fluffy bit over the top, they thought these were little mini nuclear explosions, which, which I have to say Chief of Mission found extremely amusing, and, and so did we. I think it only encouraged us to increase the amount of ice cream stops we put on our maps. <laughs> Bricksmiths tours were on the road for days at a time. They say they spent more time under canvas than any other unit in the British Army. We do anti-surveillance, or denarking as we used to call it, beforehand, because we wanted to make sure that we weren't disturbed at night when we were sleeping. You'd be doing at least 18 hour days, you know, watching railway lines and things. And actually for most of us, this was the boring bit. 
We went to bed thinking what we'd be missing, what we're missing while we were asleep. Go to great lengths to make sure that we that we weren't uh, we weren't followed. You know, we'd, we'd go hundreds of kilometres if necessary. We'd always sleep fully clothed, take our boots off, and uh, in the winter we had these hot bags that you break open and then have some on your hands and some on your feet. Get into your kennel tent and. Uh, that was it for the night. You'd be, uh, you know, snug as a bug in a rug. In we go. <laughs> boom, boom. Passage of foreign military liaison missions prohibited. Written in English, French, Russian and German. These signs had a very clear message. This sign normally lives in my shed at home on the back of the door. The Soviets put these signs around all of their training areas and installations. And of course it was a double-edged weapon. The, uh, the Soviets thought these signs were there to keep us out, but for us it just told us there was something worth looking at behind them. Despite this gung-ho attitude to security, Breaking into Red Army headquarters would have been out of the question even for Bricksmiths. But today, Dave's joining a coachload of veteran spies on a visit to the Russians' former HQ in Zoshan Wunsdorf. This is the so called secret village, once home to as many as 75,000 Soviet soldiers and their families. I'm glad they didn't pull all these down, you know, and destroy them like, yeah. like they normally would have done. A giant statue of Lenin still stands outside what was once the Russian Cultural Centre. So uh... Today, the houses are out of bounds to the public, run down and semi-derelict. Despite the decay, there are still signs of the former HQ. Grand staircases, long corridors, high ceilings and high security. Clearly not allowed in this bit. Yeah. Soundproof. Sound sound yeah. I'm guessing it's for confidential discussions and not interrogation. Uh, yeah. Cells. It didn't have the ISO container like we had. <laughs> oh, here we go, Rod. Bit of a stage. Beyond the village, a hidden complex of bunkers. The underground Soviet operations centre was hidden beneath these buildings which stood on the surface, made to look like typical German houses to disguise their real purpose. What it interesting for us was, the guys who'd been in these bunkers before, is the smell. That smell was very familiar to us as we walked in, you know, that sort of damp, dank uh, smell, which even was the case when they were occupied and the bunkers we went into during my time in the mission still suffered from damp and stuff like that. So it was, uh, it was very interesting, very nostalgic to go back in. For other members of the tour party, there's another source of excitement. In the communications bunker, an original Soviet telegram log, once top secret, is now on open display. I kind of get jittery because that's the kind of stuff that we really wanted to find, yeah. And you, you'd be searching through the dumps, through all kinds of stuff to find this to sort find, of thing. This would be the golden nugget, that's right. Or if we went into a training area where they had been with a signals unit and we found this. Interestingly enough, the Soviet army did not issue toilet paper to their soldiers. And so frequently what would happen is that uh, the soldiers would rip out pages of a log and use it to wipe their butts. So we found out where they pooped in the woods and we would actually go through that with a stick and gloves trying to pick up the pieces and we took them back with us in plastic bags. And that was worth your while? Yes. Yes, it was. Did you find good stuff doing we that? Because it's a hell of a job. <laughs> we found good stuff doing it. Yes, we did. It was just part of the job and we enjoyed it. 
30 years ago, if we'd have been caught here, we'd have been shot. You know, no doubt about it. Uh, and now just shows you, so what we risked our lives and limbs for to get intelligence information all those years ago, now, of course, is all freely, freely available, you know. We were spying and um, they knew it and we knew they knew it. And um, that was part of the game back then. We feel very lucky to have been part of that intelligence gathering machine, you know. The American sister mission, the USMLM, had just 14 members compared to the 31 in Brixmas, but they operated in a similar clandestine way. Former Major General Mike Ennis spent three years on tour with the USMLM. If there was ever going to be a conventional attack, it was going to start in East Germany. Yeah. And as a result, a lot of their best equipment and their newest equipment came in. So we were out there trying to find out. We, we monitored rail lines. Yeah. We were on the roads. We, yeah. we looked around installations to find out what they had. The yeah. T-80 tank, for example. The, yeah. Uh, yeah. the ZSU or the 2S6, yeah. uh, uh, things like that. The yeah. SA-11, the book yeah. system. You know, I was there from 86 to 89. Mm -hmm. and, and As was I, yeah. People regard that as like the heyday because that was when we saw the greatest amount of newest Soviet equipment being introduced into yeah. GSFG. And for us, of course, that gave us a tremendous uh, ability and capability to, um, to capture it either on film or on video or, or some of the other means we had. And then there were the serendipitous things like uh, uh, when the MiG-29 crashed, uh, and we watched the Soviets come out and, and haul away all of the pieces. And after about two or three days, they came with, with a bulldozer yeah. and, and graded over the site. Yeah. Well, for the next two weeks, we went in at night <laughs> on our hands and knees and dug down. And we were able to get about 350, 400 pounds of uh, electronics, of uh, uh, metal. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and we found out from that that uh, uh, the Soviets were actually further ahead in their metallurgy than we had actually realized. 2562P, small R, Scud B, no markings. A lot of you know, what we did and how we did it and the success we had was, was in part due to the enthusiasm of, of the guys on the ground, like me and you, right. you know, who, who went to extraordinary lengths, like you just said, crawling about in the dark at all hours in of the, the day mud. and night, yep. in the mud, you know, to, to find a mere scrap of something, That's which right. we took back. You know, I remember a friend of mine, a signals unit, left a, a, a deployment area and they burned all their crypto stuff and it was still on fire. And I always got this vision of my friend running into the site and diving into the fire, into the flames, <laughs> to, to save it. some of the bits that hadn't been burnt. You know, and, and then we subsequently found out, you know, from the intelligence agencies, that this was absolutely vital. You know, from that little scrap of, of uh, digital stuff that, or whatever right. crypto stuff. Partially burned. Yeah, they, they were know, able they, to. Yeah, so, so all that rolling about in the fire you know, definitely paid dividends. And another thing that would uh, uh, demonstrate some of the aggressiveness is that uh, uh, I had watched an airfield being built up in the north. And I wasn't sure whether it was East German or Soviet. As it turned out, it was Soviet. And uh, uh, I mentioned this to one of the guys on the air team. And he said, is it being built? And I said, yes. Is, it's under construction? I said, yes. He said, has the runway been laid? And I said, yeah. He said, is it guarded? And I said, no. So on his next tour, he took a sledgehammer with him and went up and actually <laughs> broke off a piece of the runway. And uh, after the analysis was done of the concrete, uh, we came to learn that it was actually of such a composition that could have defeated some of our more uh, yeah. uh, 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 active uh, bombs, if yeah. you will. You know, that sort of thing wasn't taught to us. You know, right. that was like just playing on our strengths as, a, as, as ordinary we soldiers and marines. And this was a unique a yeah. uh, 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 time in, in, in history, history, the 1947, yeah. with all the agreements between yeah. the, the, the four powers and the aftermath of World yeah. War II, and uh, uh, it turned into a reconnaissance, uh, 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 a clandestine reconnaissance yeah. outfit, and yeah. that's exactly what we did. Yeah, exactly. It was this mixture of daring and ingenuity that made the Brixmas team so successful. Okay, start moving forward. But how did they cope when their luck ran out. It had seen our tour vehicle in the woods and then fundamentally as it went up behind us 
we were then cut off. Dave Butler is back in East Germany after 30 years. He served here with Brixmas in the 1980s, gathering vital intelligence and information on Soviet troop movements. On the 14th of February, 1987, Dave and his tour officer, Alan Jacobs, set up an observation post in the woods to take photographs of a new vehicle. What then happened unexpectedly was from our right, a WAS 469 Soviet uh, Jeep came hurtling up the track here and made a sharp left turn and went up behind us. Um, the reason it was doing that is because it had seen our tour vehicle in the woods and then fundamentally as it went up behind us, we were then cut off. So the tour officer and I then decided that we would bury our equipment, that we had the camera and the, and the dictaphone. And because there was deep snow on the ground, um, we, we moved back into the woods, we buried the equipment, um, waited a few minutes, expecting to be captured ourselves, uh, and nothing happened. So we had heard our vehicle driving at high speed out of the area. We then made off to the emergency RV, which would have been uh, our outstanding operational procedure, our SOP. But the driver never showed up, and Dave and Alan realised they would have to make their own way back. 57 miles from their safe house, the pair needed to make a call back to base to arrange a pickup. In the tiny village of Colso, they found a local pub having a lock-in. Amazingly, when they knocked on the door, the landlord let the two enemy soldiers come in. We made a phone call to the British Embassy, um, and we'd always assumed that, that all lines in the GDR were monitored by the Stasi. And we found that within 30 minutes of us making the call to the British Embassy in Berlin, um, our area was alive with uh, Stasi vehicles. The East German population were warned that assisting the missions in any shape or form, you know, was a criminal offence and that they would be arrested. So, you know, for the guy to even let us into his establishment, it, let alone make a phone call, uh, from it was uh, taking a huge risk on on his part and uh, and I'm sure that after the event you know uh, the Stasi would have gone in because they would have traced the call and known where it's taken from so I'm sure he would have been questioned by the Stasi on you know how many people were in there what we asked what we were doing and all the rest of it now Dave's going back to see if he can find the pub that gave him sanctuary on that night. I guess what we really recognised was, was the shape of the place and that could be it over there. Let's just have a look. Hmm. OK, well, there's only one way to find out. Go and knock on the door. It clearly doesn't look like a pub anymore, but um, we'll, uh, we'll just see. See if anybody knows Herr Urtl. Guten Tag. Uh, I'm, ich möchte befinden uh, Herr Urtl's Familie. Ja, das. Ja, uh, is that? Yeah, yeah. And, and sie ist er. Ah, so ich bin Herr Butler, uh, mein Freund und mich, uh, many years ago. Sie waren damals... Wenn Sie es war eine Gestatte. Ja. Wir Gastatte. kommen hier. Hallo. With a military mission. And uh, er, er husband was. let us use the telephone ja. to, uh, to make a call. Schönen Dank. Das sieht oh, oh. nicht mehr aus. Ja, ja. Das ist so. Das ist so, wie ja. es früher war. Das ist so, wie 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 es früher war. Das ist so
Yeah. They had the box yeah. up your pile. Yeah. Yeah. They, were, they were having a lock in the night we came, and this was um, this is where they all were. And and in telephone is in the nail. Oh yeah, yeah, and 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 here's the picture of Herr Ortl and Alan when he came to visit. Yeah. Alan Jacobs, mein yeah, Freund, yeah. and Dave Butler. That's you. Yeah, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> Good. This is where the telephone would have been yeah. that we made. Yeah. We made. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yet, and yet, yeah, uh, it's more modernish. Yeah. yeah. But uh, back then, it was uh, it was a. Uh, you know, not quite so modern, yeah. In moment, in moment, okay. Okay, so what, what she just told me is that, is that uh, they were very aware that the Stasi uh, were um, looking at, as far as I could understand from the German, and, uh, and she knew that they were in the area uh, very shortly afterwards, and, um, but she doesn't have any recollection of them actually coming in and talking to her, but that doesn't mean to say that they didn't question her husband. Me and my friend wandered in on a dark winter's night. It was snowing outside and, and they let us in. And, and saying this room at the time was full of people um, and they were all having what we would call in the UK a lock-in, you know. And, um, and so, you know, it was like, so we looked fairly cold and wet and hungry. And, uh, and I guess it was that human thing. They just took pity on us. And um, whilst realising the, uh, you know, what they were doing and the penalties they could pay for doing it. Shandank. And, uh, and, you know, who knows? We may see you again. Back in 1987, after Dave and Alan made that crucial phone call from the Ertl's pub, the Stasi descended on the village. The pair were finally picked up by a Bricksmith driver at three in the morning. So, what an experience that was. You know, 33 years later, and here I am back in the pub room again. I mean, I was not expecting when we undid that door to find that although the pub had gone, they've kept it almost like a, like a museum. It was like walking in that door at nine o'clock at night, you know, back in whenever it was, you know, 87, 88. Dave left Germany in June 1989, just a few months before the Berlin Wall finally fell and the entire Eastern Bloc began to disintegrate. I left here having no clue as to that that was about to happen. And I, and I would say that anybody who said they did, you know, was not really telling the truth. I don't think anybody had, had any idea that, that that was about to happen. We were gutted, I think is the term, that the wall came down because we'd hoped we'd go back again for a third tour with Bricksmiths, but... Uh, the world moved on and so did we. In the uncertainty that followed, the world was desperate to know if this spelt the end for the Soviet Union. Some journalists came to him and said, General, is it the end of the Cold War? He looked carefully at the journalist and he said, you can't imagine how much I want to believe it is. I think all of us were glad that, that you know, we never actually had to go to war together, you know. Absolutely. Um, and then it all ended, you know, I mean, nobody could ever imagine that, that we'd have a, a non-bloodshed reunification. Serving in the foreign missions was a life-changing experience for these extraordinary men. Everyone I've ever spoken to was at any one of the missions, at Bricksmiths, FMLM, or you, I've never met a soul who didn't say it was the best experience they've ever had in the military and even beyond in regular life. So. The thing that stood out was that um, you were able to have a real-world mission, you were, you were involved in something that at that time was extremely important, you confronted in quotations an enemy. I miss it every day, I still, first thing I look at on a car is its number plate. I can't cross past a railway line without looking for trains full of armoured vehicles. It, it doesn't leave you, it's a, but it's a nice, a nice afterglow as opposed to an unpleasant one. There was no other unit in the British Army that was allowed to go into the heart of the enemy's territory and basically spy on them. 
We were in the backyard, and that, yeah. there will probably never be a time in history um, when we will have this kind of an opportunity again, yeah. because the Russians are certainly not going to allow yeah. uh, uh, the British, French, and Americans to be around any of their military installations <laughs> in Russia with a free hand. <laughs> All right, chaps, I think we've got enough out of this as we're going to. Let's go.